Tyrese said what up to me. James said what up to me. And they both told me, like, just keep going. Um, after that one, I was kind of like, all right, I'm, I'm Yeah, you're like, I'm the, cool on all of like, it now. I'm over the fan <laughs> thing. Like, I'm good to help <laughs> NBA player now. All right, so Tyrese, it is good to see you, as always. Um, and although you are a dear friend of mine, we have a long-standing feud about the draft that happened <laughs> <laughs> on Old Man and the Three. So shout out to JJ and Tommy, first of all. Secondly, I think that we need to settle this once and for all. So the draft was moments in history. In American history. I feel like you're adding that on. I think that's another point of contention for us. Okay. Okay, okay. but you say American history, we'll say it was moments in American history that we wish Twitter existed. Yes. I feel like I ran away with this draft. I think I was the clear winner. Why do you disagree? You chose the birth of Jesus, if I'm <laughs> correct. And I don't know, one, if that's American history, and two, who's tweeting about it? That's the point. Because it's like, oh, you're like, oh my gosh, the birth of Jesus Christ? How did this happen? Yeah, but I wanted picks. I wanted like picks that made sense, like the OJ chase. Like We had that. That, that makes that's logical to yes. me. But the birth of Jesus, who's, who's tweeting about it, one, and that's not American history. We said, don't do anything crazy. Did somebody pick the Big Bang? That is also a great pick. You picked that. I had another great pick. I just want to also be clear, though, as we talk about this, the audience said I won. Did they? Yes or no? Let's be clear. They did. I Thank can't, you. I cannot lie, but I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking like 1990s, 80s moments, like, like positive moments. And there was just some wild card picks. You picked the birth of Jesus and the Big Bang. Somebody <laughs> picked some other crazy stuff. I went with some realistic things, and I probably finished last in the draft. So it now, happens. Tyrese, you have been on Twitter long enough to know that is not the place for positivity. That's a fact. Unfortunately. So I was playing to the Twitter audience. Yes, you, you know, were. What are 100. some things that this app would just go back and forth about forever? And that's why... I made my picks. Yeah, that's fair. I yeah. get it. I totally get it. But so we got to get to another feud, and that is, what did you do to Wally Zerbiak? I, I have no clue. Um, <laughs> I, my phone's been blowing up about it the past couple of days, just people sending me it. Uh, you know, I, I think everybody's entitled to their own basketball opinion. Uh, but yeah, to be honest, I, I'm a basketball historian. I feel like I know a lot about the game. Mm-hmm. I know the name Wally Zerbiak. I couldn't tell you where he played. I couldn't tell you what he did as a basketball player. Um, no disrespect to the people who come before me, but uh, I don't know. He had a lot to say about me. And I, don't know, I was really like questioning, like, first, who is this? And uh, why is he talking about me like this? But it happens. Yeah, so to set the stage, he did. He called you, what, a wannabe all-star? Yeah. Yeah, but I feel like there was some more color in there, though. It was, it was definitely pretty pointed. Yeah, he made the point. Pretty emphatically a couple times. And I don't know if I've ever came out and said, like, I want to be an all-star this year. Please vote for me. I didn't, I didn't, I don't think I've done that. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think he was just excited about a Knicks win, um, and that got him going. But, uh, you know, we played Knicks again in a couple weeks, and, uh, you know, I'm just going to continue to worry about what I have going on on our, on our side of things. And, uh, you know, he's, he's just doing whatever he can to get attention and, uh, that's just that's just the media these days. So when you hear, you know, media members or former players who are now in the media discussing your game, are there times where it hits differently than others? If you hear that, does it make you feel a way about yourself? Or how do you kind of compartmentalize what people are saying about you? Yeah, I think it's, I don't know. I think I'm a human being. So you have your days where you try to uh, let things kind of just brush off. and But it, you you choose who you, you know, listen to. For me, it's like, uh, you know, people who really know me, people who I value their opinions, right? Like if Magic Johnson comes out and says anything about me, positive or negative, that's going to mean something to me because I've watched him, you know, my whole my whole life, like from old film and stuff. Like LeBron, we played the Lakers the other day. He had something to say about me. Uh, granted, it was positive, but that meant a lot to me because I grew up watching him. Um, but there's some people who, like, uh, shout out to my guy, M. Grads, left-hand layup challenge. Like, am I really, like some, a lot of people on Twitter or do I care what you – if they can't make a left-hand layup, why does, it matter, why does that matter to me? So, like – That's the barometer. There's so many times where I want to 
reply to people and be like, yo, send me a video of you making a left-hand layup full <laughs> speed, uh, and then maybe I'll think about it. But, uh, yeah, I think that just comes with kind of the, the notoriety of being an NBA player. Everybody has their opinions on you, and mm-hmm. uh, you got to choose who you listen to. And, I mean, going off of what he said, I mean, so it, it came from you missing the go-ahead jumper to potentially win the game for your team um, against the Knicks. I didn't necessarily understand the correlation between missing that shot and being an all-star. Yeah, like I said, he's, I think it's just a thing for clicks, right? Yeah. Like it's, every major media outlet has said something about it to this point. I've been tagged in it a million times on social media. So uh, it's just whatever to get people talking. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the unfortunate part of – some former NBA players, they just want to hear their name, you know, be said again. And so that just, that comes with it. But, um, yeah, I mean, he's entitled to his own opinion as a basketball player. Uh, I just hope when I'm, you know, done playing that that's not me. I, I'll see no point to, you know, hate on the, the people coming after me or the ones before me, to be honest. But uh, it happens. Well, you are taking it like a, like a true pro. But on that subject, I mean, all-star, that has to be something that you do have uh, your sights set on. What is that a goal for you coming into this year? And Where do you feel like you're lining up at this moment? Uh, For me, you know, this is like obviously my first opportunity to be a lead guard. Uh, There's been a lot of expectations and people who wanted to see what I would bring this year being, you know, the full-time point guard here and all the hype and love I get in Indiana. So, um, you know, I was really excited to come into the year and just perform the way that I wanted to. Um, You know, I worked really, really hard this summer to have a successful year and I didn't know what that was because I had never seen it and I think as an NBA player, for me, it's like, how can I be the best version of Tyrese Halliburton? Not like, how can I, you know, be better than this guy, better than that guy? It's just like, what is the best version of me? And I don't know that. And um, I, I still think we're a few years from being able to know exactly what that is. But um, it's exciting for me. And, and it all comes with team success. And I mean, we're outperforming expectations. And that's making me look better and making a lot of other guys look better because we're doing better as a team. So uh, that's the biggest thing. But even my dad this morning, uh, he was at my house when I was packing, getting ready to go. And he was like, yo, can you believe that guy said that about you, about the All-Star? Like, All-Star? Like, I w- who would have thought that you'd be an All-Star at this point? And, like, that's my dad. He's my biggest fan. Yeah. And so, like, for him to say that, it's still like, wow, you know, it's crazy that we're here. But, um, you know, as long as the, the team's doing the right things, everything else will follow. No, I love that. And, you know, one thing that I have learned about really just, like, life and goal setting in general, I've talked about, about this before, is – Sometimes when we set these expectations for ourselves or our team, we unknowingly are limiting what the outcome could be. Like, I'm sure you got to the Pacers and you had an idea of like, okay, these are my expectations. This is what I can do. But as time kept going on and you realized how good this team was, those expectations continue to shift and go up and go forward. So what did you think the team could do when you first arrived? And so what do you think they can do now? How did that change? (laughs) So when I first arrived, it's a funny story. I tell people this all the time. Um, I got traded. The Pacers played the Hawks that day in Atlanta, but they had just traded three guys. Everybody was hurt. So they barely squeaked out enough guys to even play the game. So I turned the game on with my girl, and we're watching it. She doesn't know a ton about NBA basketball, but she was looking at me the whole time like, you're going to this, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, are you not watching this? Like, are you okay? Uh, yeah, I was like trying to, eh, it's okay, like, we'll be fine. Uh, so, like, <laughs> last year was just like, I mean, obviously, they kind of had the same record that I had with the Kings before I got there, and uh, it was obvious that we weren't going to make the playoffs. So I don't, I think last year we lost the last 10 or whatever the case may be, and so it was kind of just about getting familiar with guys, kind of understanding what, uh, how I can be better, like, the adjustment for me to be like from like second, third on the scouting report to moving to the first guy, it really you know showed for me last year. And so coming into this year, obviously there's a lot of talk about Miles could get traded, Buddy could get traded. Um, you know nobody's really safe on our roster coming into the year. So um, you know I was just thinking, well, with the roster that we do have, I think there's like a chance there. I think we have a chance to do something uh, to get back to the playoffs. Uh, I think we got. I think it's hard with. You know, if you have me, Ben, Miles, and Buddy, and some other guys, it's hard for that team, you know, to struggle. So I was looking at it like I think there's a chance there. So uh, just coming into the year, it was like let's just uh, prove people wrong. Like I think we are picked 15th in the East by every major sports outlet there is, yeah. uh, probably 30th in the NBA. Uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people saying we were in the Wemby sweepstakes and stuff like that. And so, like, for me it was like – and I don't want to do that. Like, yeah. I, like, let's win. Let's do what we can and, like, 
try to prove people wrong. So it's exciting. No, yeah, it's been so fun to watch. And what game or moment did it really hit you like, yeah, I'm the first guy in the scouting report now? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I, that, I don't know if I can point out anything in specific. Uh, I think last year was kind of just a ebbs and flows type of time. Like when I first got there, I think I had like maybe like 20 and 10 in the first game. And then it was like, all right, have a good game here. And then like we played OKC and like I was expected to take the game winner. And I was like, I've never been in this situation before yeah. since like college, you know. Uh, so it was like, okay, now I see the expectations not only from – you know, how other people are guarding me, but from our, our, us from an organizational standpoint mm. and everybody looking at me like, make or miss it, we're letting you, like, you're going to shoot it. And so mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a crazy transition period for me because everybody, when you come to the NBA, everybody was a superstar in high school. Everybody was a superstar in college. Like most everybody was stars in college. Yeah. And when you get to the NBA, you're just trying to buy into a role. And for me, when I got to SAC, uh, I'm just like trying to buy into how I can like, how can I play and how can I, like, eventually start? And then how can I coincide with Aaron and how can we do something successful versus coming to Indiana? And it was kind of like starting from scratch almost because mm -hmm. it was, I guess, a soft rebuild. It was a, a kind of a quick thing, but um, just kind of being looked at as the guy in uh, multiple facets is different. Yeah. I know there is obviously a lot, of, a lot of talk and attention around that trade and you ending up, you know, with the Pacers. I know it was initially really difficult for you. But now do you feel like, this is almost serendipitous. Like you were supposed to be here in this moment and you're doing the things that you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I think obviously I had an immature thing, immature view on things when it happened. Um, and let's just call it as like I was hurt. Like I was really frustrated um, with everybody and everything. And I know like eventually this sound bite's going to come out and people are going to be like, he doesn't shut up about the trade, right? Uh, <laughs> I asked the question, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like... And obviously I was mad, but when I got to India, it was like, man, why would I question God's plan for me? And um, just understanding that I'm I'm here for a reason. This is another organization who values me, um, you know, another organization who has a lot of faith in me as a basketball player and a person, and that means a lot. And so instead of taking my energy and putting it towards something negative and just being mad all the time and, you know, talking about negative things, it was like, how can I put this into something successful and turn it into something positive? Um, you know, for, for me, myself, but us as an organization as well. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm talking generally here, not specifically about, the, you know, the ins and outs of the trade, but you said something that is simple but really profound because a lot of people don't just say when their feelings have been hurt. And I think that at the core of almost everything, it's hurt feelings. Whenever you're, like, sad or upset, you feel like somebody has hurt you in some way. How do you get over hurt feelings and not let them impact how you view yourself? Yeah, that's a tough question. I, I think it's it's different for everybody, their process behind it. For me, it's like a lot of self-reflection, to be honest. Um, like kind of taking a step back and understanding like uh, like where am I, where my feet are right now, where do I want to go, you know, things like that. Like I did an exercise this summer. I did a little uh, camp with PGC, great, great, great people. And we were writing down like our regrets in life, our resentments in life. Like, I was like, resentments? I don't have any resentments. And I was like, hold on, Sacramento Kings. And then I was like, that is so dumb that I'm, like, holding on to that and still angry about that. Uh, so, like, it honestly took until, like, mid-late summer for me to get over it. Uh, understanding that I had a great opportunity in front of me and things are going to happen. But still just I was still just mad, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, social media, people calling me out all the time. Like, that's frustrating as well. Uh, but it was like, you know, like, some, like you said, like I'm getting asked these questions and I'm answering them and I'm thinking like I'm being real and authentic and I'm telling the truth. And then people are just like, all right, shut up. After a while, <laughs> you know? And so then I'm like, all right, like uh, there's a question in your mind. Like, are they right? Like, should I stop talking about it? And I think the great part of where we are today is that us as athletes, we're allowed to share our emotions and share how we feel and not be looked at crazy and um, I think that's important. Uh, we're in a great, great space today. And obviously there's room for us to grow as a culture, as a world. Um, but yeah, I just, for me, it's just a lot of self-reflection, just looking at it, like, how can I be better? And how can I get over this to turn that negative energy into something positive? Did writing your regrets and resentments help you get rid of them? I think so. I think so. And it was crazy because it was, it was an exercise where people obviously were writing about, you know, 
there's a coach that might have wronged them or something. You know what I mean? Something like that. Maybe it was a girl. Maybe it was, you know what I mean? What was it? Um, and for me, it was like almost like a whole organizational, like a whole organization, you know? And, and I don't have any feelings about it anymore. Like, it's done and over. I'm excited to be here. Mm-hmm. We went to SAC. I was like, all right, this game might mean a little more for me. We got popped. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like it happens, you know? And so, like, uh, you just got to kind of move on and, yeah. um, you know, th- things will, you know, work out for the best. You know, when you talk about what athletes talk about in the media, it's almost like this lose-lose because so I'm a person who wants – athletes to be really authentic and real and talk about what's on their mind. And you would think that's what most people want. But then they'll say something and you're like, well, I didn't want you to say that. Yeah. I didn't want you to be that real. How have you learned to navigate kind of that balance? And not about talking about that, but just in general, because you're a person who is always themselves. You step in as you, and that's what you give to others. Mm. But I can also see why sometimes you'd feel like you almost can't be yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think... For me, it's kind of understanding, like, what what are people going to take from this? And is this, like, a positive or a negative? Am I helping anybody out there by sharing my emotions and my feelings and letting people feel like they can be open about things? Uh, but to be honest, for me, it's just, like, how I was raised by my mom and dad to just be who you are um, and be honest in your truth, you know, be honest in who you are as a person. Um, and sometimes there's times where I just hold back from saying what I really want to say because it's, like, what is this going to be turned into? Because that's what the me- that's what media is today. Is like, mm-hmm. how can we turn this soundbite into something uh, bigger than it is? And that happens all the time. And so it's just kind of understanding when's the right time to talk about things, when's the right time not to. Uh, how do I bite my tongue on certain things, and how do I speak out about certain mm-hmm. things? And it's kind of on a case by case basis. Like, what's worth your time and energy? Uh, but I mean, there are some guys who are just unapologetic unapologetically them all the time yeah. and uh for better or worse mm-hmm. and uh but I, I think every athlete has times where it's like just bite my tongue on this one mm-hmm. and move on because it's, it's just not worth your energy do you consider any part of yourself a member of the media now that you're a uh, you're uh, a little correspondent yeah <laughs> i know i i i don't know i i think a lot of people i get people come up to me in the airport all the time or where I am like, yo, JJ needs to give you your own podcast. And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't want to talk about yes. basketball all the time, you know? Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, I think Draymond's funny because he's got, like, the whole, like, new media thing. Hashtag yeah. new media, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but I don't I don't think I'm necessarily a part of the new media, but maybe I am because I'm on there kind of often. You I, are on there. And I do talk basketball, so yeah. maybe I am, but that doesn't even sound right, me saying that, so... <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say no for now. Really? No? I feel like it's, at minimum, it's a gray area. A gray area. It's gray, a gray area. Gray area. I, but I think you're like, okay, dang, I don't want to just be the podcaster. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're like, I sure. don't want to just be playing the game and then setting up my mic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To do it. That's a fact. Yeah. Okay, if you had a podcast that you weren't talking about basketball on, what would the podcast topic be? Okay. Yeah, well... I mean, currently, I have a podcast with Autograph right now where we talk about like, crypto and yes. stuff like that. Um, but uh, I don't know. For me, it's like I just like to chill at the house, chill with my dog and game. <laughs> so like, it's like I like being on Twitch. Like I like gaming and just talking to fans and stuff like that versus having a whole podcast. Like I like going on JJ from time to time uh, to share basketball knowledge or you know I, I love being it like last year during the finals I was really big on what Wiggins was doing like I was kind of pointing that out early um and now it makes me look like a genius but I think I really was just like liking what Wiggins was doing and so yeah. like it makes me look better than I am but um sometimes it's like going on there and just talking hoop because I mean at the end of the day basketball is mostly my life so yeah um uh, yeah, it's like sharing knowledge for sure. Yeah. Well, you were great on NBA Twitter Live, so I, I can I see the full fledged media potentially in the yeah, future. Yeah, in the future. Yeah, when you're not lacing them up and then getting the wires yeah, no, and no, Mike no, and, no. and all those things. No. Um, you talked about your mom a bit and, and how your parents have raised you to be this person. I know I've made you tell the story before, but it's my favorite story. Please tell everyone about your mom's birthday and the gift or lack of that you gave her on the court. Yes. So <laughs> my mom, up until college, never missed a game of my life. Um, she missed a couple games in college, but not a ton. So she always comes to my NBA games. She moved to Sacramento my second year. Yeah, my second year she moved to Sacramento, so now she's at every game at home. 
So for her birthday, I got her tickets to courtside, courtside on the floor. Courtside, we're playing the yeah. Sixers. George Niang, good friend of mine. She's like so excited. She has to watch me against George. Um, then the, the Sixers come out for the game, and they're like, "Yeah, we're sitting six dudes. Like we're not playing our whole starting five. And I'm like, "Oh, I'm like, all right, about to cook. I'm about to cook tonight. <laughs> Donut, zero points. <laughs> it's like." Over six, uh, something like that. No points. Uh, no points. No points. And I was just <laughs> sick when I got to the back. Uh, but then this year, we played the 21st, the day before her birthday. Uh, I wore the same shoes. I was like, <laughs> I'm going to wear the same shoes to like right my wrong here. And I had a good game. And mom's of course side all the games now, so it's exciting. Okay, but when you came back to her when you had the zero points, did she like say anything about it or was it just... Like, okay, we know I didn't have a good game. Let's yeah. leave it be. There was no comment like, dang, you had zero on my birthday. Uh, <laughs> but it's more like, uh, like you know, hope, you know, I hope the seats were awesome. You know, love you. She left the house. And I was sitting there kind of looking at the ceiling like, dang, I really had zero on my mom's <laughs> birthday. Crazy, crazy. Time. No, I'm so glad because I texted you the day before your mom's birthday. I'm like, all right, we're going to get him yeah. this year. <laughs> yeah. Career night for you. So I'm glad it went it went better yes. this time around. Yes. Good. I love that story. Legit, my favorite. How do you bounce back from a game like that, though? Well, I, I recently had a game against Miami at one point. Yeah. And um, that was tough because it's like, again, I say, like, I don't want to talk about basketball all the time, but it is my life. And it does. Sometimes I, I always tell people when they have bad games, like, yo, once you shower, it's off you. Go home. Get over it. Yeah. It'll be better tomorrow. And for me, it just stuck with me. Like, I couldn't sleep, like, just looking at the ceiling, like, what just happened? Uh, and they had, a, I mean, Eric Spolstra, the Miami Heat, such a great team. They, yeah. they defend at a high level. Bam is probably the best switch big in the league. Um, but, man, I feel like I was missing shots. And uh, especially early, I was just missing some shots. And then it got to the point where, like, I was overthinking about everything. And I think us as NBA players, when there's a great shooter struggling, I think it's a mental thing. Yes. You know? And mm -hmm. so that's with anybody. Like, they're just taking that extra thought, and now shots aren't going, and they're thinking too much. And that's where I was, to be honest. I was completely, like, I stayed at the gym for, like, two hours after the game and shot uh, on the practice side. And I was like, you know, it's like one of those days where it's like, all right, you're shooting by yourself, and you're making them. And you're, like, mad you're making them. And then you're missing them, and you're mad you're missing them. Like, yeah. what's going on with me? And it just took, it took, took over me a little bit. And so, like, it was, like, the great thing about the NBA is you play – in a day, two days, three days. So, like, the next day of practice, I wasn't myself. I was pissed. Everybody can, knew I was pissed. Um, everybody, all the coaches want to talk to me about it. I'm like, I don't want to talk to you about it. Let's just get to tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and then even to start that game against Golden State, I was struggling. I, I, I felt like nothing could go. Um, but it, it's, it's just a mental thing more than mm -hmm. anything. It's just, like, how can you put your energy towards something else and not, and not like, you know, be stuck on – one point because I know I'm yeah. not a one point player like yeah I probably had two three games in my whole NBA career at one point or less so um or less <laughs> <laughs> or less zero or less, yeah. birthday uh but it's just trying to get over it as quick as possible and uh just understanding that you know everybody has good days bad days I'm I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that's my last game ever having zero field goals right. made. Yeah. Like, that's probably gonna happen again I hope I play this game a long time and um, it's probably going to happen again, but, um, you know, it, it happens through the course of a year and you just got to move on. How has something like overthinking impacted your life and your life as a basketball player? Yeah. Uh, I think it's, I think us as human beings, like that's everything. I think that's everything. I think I have a lot of friends who overthink about things and it's easy when it's not you yeah. to be like, yo, stop thinking about it. You're good. Get over it. Yeah. Uh, but it's hard when it's you and it's hard when it's something that digest your life is something that's like so important like there's people who you know if it's like overthinking about their job or a marital problem or whatever the case may be like it's hard not to because it's it is it's a part of their everyday life and it's a major part of it so um yeah anytime I'm in a in a struggle uh not having like the best like week of games or whatever for me it's like take a step back and like look at the grand scheme of things like I took I was like all right I shot 0 for 8 really how do you evaluate a game on eight shots? Like, how do mm -hmm. I, how do I do that? Like I could have made my next five or six mm -hmm. and been six for 14. Exactly. And we would never talk about it again. Like nobody would ever say anything about it in a negative way. So, uh, like I didn't give myself a chance to even have a decent game because I started 
thinking too much. And that's kind of been the mental shift for me going from being a guy who's just a ball mover and a role guy to like trying to make that jump to be a, you know, all-star in this league jump to, you know, help change an organization is like, I kind of have to get old. Like I'm a, almost a perfectionist to a sense, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so like my whole life I've shot a good field goal percentage, a good three point percentage. Like that's just been because I'm like, this shot probably ain't going to go in. I'm going to get off it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I've missed four in a row. I'm not shooting this one. Whereas, like, I still go through that through the course of a season because it's hard to just change mm-hmm. your mentality at, th- at times. Uh, but that's where I have to get to is, like, I missed four in a row. I might miss this one. I'm, I'm going to make this one. If I miss it, the next one going. You yeah. Know? And so that's – Always thinking that next Exactly. One. Thinking about the positive thing. So yeah. uh, that's, that's the biggest struggle I'm at right now and just trying to get over that in the best way I can. Yeah. You know, it's funny because whenever somebody, you know, says they're a perfectionist or talks about being a perfectionist, a lot of the time you almost take it as a positive. You're like, they want things to be perfect and be right. But being a perfectionist can hurt you a lot of times too because then you won't stop until it's exactly what you think. And a lot of the times when you're just being loose and allowing things to happen, that actually is the perfection. Yeah. Like make, creating the perfection can be really, really hard because then you are going to think about how, well, you're already not perfect because you missed those other ones. For sure. But instead of thinking about it as, well, there's more time to be perfect. And so just like shifting how, like how you view it in that way, um, I feel like would help as well, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. And it's like coming into this year, I would have never said I'm a perfectionist. I would have never agreed with anybody about that. Like, I would have been like, no, I don't see what you're talking about. Um, but Drew Hanlon, my, my trainer that I started working Shout with. Out Shout Love out to Drew. Shout out Drew. Uh, he calls me after every game. He'd be so mad at me. Like, I could have a game, <laughs> I could have a game like 30, 14, and like three steals, no turnovers. He'll call me and just be pissed. Because he's like, you had 25 in the first half, and you shot two shots in the second half. And I'll try to come up with an excuse. And he's like, I'm not accepting it. You know what I mean? (laughs) And and, uh, it's just like those games, like he's like, I'll be more proud of you if you go, if you go one for, you know, one for 16 and have six points versus you going, you know, 10 for 11 and having 28. Like Mm -hmm. he's like, I'd rather it be the other way, you know, because that just meant, you know, you just kept shooting. You, you weren't worrying about that. And so I'm seeing the mental shift for you and, um, He's the one who's holding me accountable to that all the time. And, uh, you know, it, it means a lot to have him in my corner. That's so great. I love Drew. Drew Hanlon, he's great. What, he works out with you, with Jason Tatum, with yeah. Embiid. Yeah. Am I missing another? Uh, Brad, Zachary, Brad, yeah. Tyler, yeah. Yeah, no, else? he's great. He's great. Shout out to Drew. Um, I was reading an interview that you did with The Ringer, and you said something that I thought was really profound, saying that talent evaluation is hard because you can't evaluate heart. Elaborate on what you mean by that. What's heart to you? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like your heart, your mental, right? Like how you, like talent evaluators only really see what's on the floor, right? And for them, heart is, does he play hard? Like, does he play hard? What does that mean? Yeah. You know what I mean? Or like, he just had a bad game. He had a better game the next game. That's heart. Like, what does that mean? You yeah. know what I mean? And so it's like, for me, I think the way I look at it is like, I was the number 12 pick and whatever reason that was and, you know, don't know. I mean, I told some people, no, I think some teams didn't want me, whatever the case may be, right? And, and if you do a redraft, I'm probably drafted higher, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's like, people are always like, how did this team miss on Tyrese? How did this team miss on Desmond Bain? How did this team miss on Tyrese Maxey? Right, like, you can't evaluate how hard guys work. Mm-hmm. Like, that's tough because... When it comes to like when we're coming out of college, right, or coming out of high school, or coming out of wherever, these talent evaluators are going to ask people in our life or people who have been around us, how hard does this person work? What do you think my college coach is going to say about how hard I work? He's the hardest, hardest worker of them you, all. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like that could be true, but but it um, probably a lot of times isn't true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And mm-hmm. they could ask this person and that person, you know, like. How does he react to a bad game? Oh, he just like, you know, he's really positive the next day. He just can't wait to get to the next one. <laughs> like, no, like that's yeah. not the truth. Yeah. And like, so these talent values aren't, aren't always getting the truth from people. And that's just how it is. And sometimes they could go to people who they feel will have an unbiased opinion. And that does happen from time to time. But um, you can't evaluate how hard a person is willing to work. Um, 
you know, I, I think some guys peak at a – or, like, this is the player you are at 25 years old and they're just that player for the rest of their career. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, that's that, that happens all the time. But, you know, like, what guy's willing to go every offseason and, you know, put a new part to their game and, um, you know, w- what would make a guy fall in love with the game more to – when he was, like, 19, he didn't really – want to like he liked basketball but it's whatever by the time he's 25 he's thinking like man i probably want to coach when i'm done you know like that that happens all the time like Mm -hmm. you can't evaluate that that's impossible Mm -hmm. to evaluate so but like man talent evaluation is hard it is hard i don't envy those people i don't at all because you're making tough decisions that have a future outlook that how do you really know what the case may be you don't know what could happen or you know what guy's gonna blossom what guy's not and Mm -hmm. so um it's 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 hard but uh, so that's why I don't that's why I don't really dwell on like I was a twelfth pick or you know, like for me it's like still a twelfth pick, like I was a lottery pick. Like I yeah. <laughs> yeah. These are good problems to have. But I could I kinda could pick up. You don't necessarily love that you were the twelfth oh, pick. Oh yeah, not a big fan. <laughs> not a big fan of some of of uh some of the teams that have passed on me. But I mean yeah. like I understand it's hard and mm-hmm. like people always think it's like my friends thought it was cool that like I could name the eleven guys drafted before me, but I'm like I'm not the guys like undrafted can name all six. <laughs> yeah, years. it's only eleven. <laughs> like, come on, it's yeah. not that big of a deal. Yeah. You know? Where did you think you were gonna go? Ooh. Um, okay, so going to the night, there was a lot of options that I thought were possible, but I would say the number one would be Detroit. I mm. thought I was gonna go to Detroit for sure. And really? Yeah, I was. I had a really good workout with them. Good interview. Thought everything went well. Um, I thought for sure I was going to Detroit. To be honest, yeah. And that was. Seven. Killian. Yeah, Killian went seven. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that was so many. Wow. And so you were like, this is going to be my spot. You felt like through conversations, through feel, it was going to be. Yeah, I thought, I thought so. I mean, going into the draft, I, I actually had a call with Sacramento like a day or two before the draft. And they were like, we're trying to trade up to get you. And I was like, yeah, okay. Like, you guys waited till November to tell me <laughs> to so you talk to me. <laughs> uh, but, like, they sent us a big box with draft hats in mm-hmm. them, right? And, it, and they were sorted by division. And so I went through them, and I put the team most likely in the division to pick me in front of, of each slot, right? So I was like, because I was like, you don't know who's going to pick you. Like, yeah. mom, if, if this team picks me, you got to grab the hat. Like, it's going to be in the front. And so, like, the Pacific division, the only team likely was the Kings. And so, like, everybody would ask me that day, like, where do you think you're going to get drafted? All my friends. And I'd be like, ah. Sacramento, because they basically gave me a promise at 12 mm. if they were there. Mm-hmm. And so I, I like, <laughs> there's a lot of times where people ask me a question and I, I'll kind of set the bar low because if it's higher, I'll feel better yeah. about it. You know? <laughs> and so I was like, oh, I'll be the 12th, I'm, I'm going to go 12 to the Kings. But yeah. I didn't actually think that I was going to go 12 to the Kings. Oh, you were like, I'm going to Detroit. I was like, yeah, I was like, Chicago could pick me at four, Detroit could pick me at seven, New York could pick me at eight, Golden State might trade down, all these different, all these different, you know, possibilities. And, Sack, it ended up being sack. Wow. So it could have been you were piston initially. Yes. Yes, it could have been. Yeah. Got it. What an interesting little tidbit. Yeah. So, like, what was your shock level when you weren't picked? Uh, Nothing. To be okay. Honest. Nothing, nothing. Because it was like, like, I'm going to go at some point. Then. Yeah, yeah. I was not a highly ranked kid growing up. Or yeah. like, so I was like, I've kind of felt like my whole life I've been overlooked. So it was like, it's not a new feeling for me to, like, be passed up on or, you know what I mean? That's not a new feeling. So, yeah. Uh, you know, I just kind of understand that. There's so many little things about the draft that, like, you never really realize. Like, I don't think most fans know this stuff about the hat. Like, what things about the draft surprised you when you were actually there? Like, oh, this is how it works. Well, like, I was in the COVID draft, too. So, like, yeah. way, way different than everybody else. But, like... So you had to just be ready to do it for on air. On air, yeah. Because yeah. it was like, you had to... Everybody had to assign a person to hand them the hat. And it yeah. had, like, a meaning to it. And for me, it was, like, my mom, because love my mom like you know like she's gonna hand me the hat but like you know Woj and and Shams have the the draft pick before it right (laughs) so like I told everybody I'm like I'm not gonna look I was like but I had them both on notification (laughs) so I was like like, ah they're not picking me you know and I'd look across the room my agent Dave like right like you know while it still says like you know a minute left I haven't made the pick yet he'd look at me and be like the whole time, right? I'm like, oh, okay, okay. You know, it's like, and like on Jay Billis's big board, I was four. So like after the first three picks, it was like Panda Tyrese, Panda Tyrese, Panda Tyrese. And I'm just sitting in my living room like. Chilling. You know, Hi, guys. Like, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know what's going on either, guys. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, there's a bunch of little things. But, yeah, the COVID draft is a very interesting time. Would you say you're a fan of the knowing before the person is drafted? Or do you like taking yourself out of it? Like, okay. besides the 2020 draft, do you like that we know the picks before they're announced? Um, not really. Not yeah. really. I don't really like it. But the fact that it's there, I have to look. And yeah. Like, I got what was our notification today yeah. so like don't we all yeah so like i'm gonna know the pick and like yeah. this year when it was ben like i knew that if the kings took keegan at four that we were that was it keegan went four ivy went five yeah mm-hmm. mather went six yeah i knew that if keegan went four we were gonna get ben at six yeah. and so when i saw the Woj notification it was like because I, I wasn't able to watch the draft at the time i was flying and i was like Oh, yes. Yeah, you know, so. I really like Ben. Yeah. I interviewed him, obviously, after the Pacer drafted him. And he just has such a good energy and a good confidence about him. But, like, a real confidence. Yeah. Not like I'm doing this because people want me to be the guy that has it all together. He, like, actually believes these things about himself. And I remember reading something once where you said after games he goes and watches film with your coach. Mm. And you're like, you never see guys ever do that on the plane. Yeah, yeah. What is it about Ben that just like makes him so focused like that? I think it's like he lives by what he says. And like he always says like some people play the game because they love it. I play the game because I want to be one of the greatest. And like mm-hmm. obviously that's a very lofty goal. Like, you know, like that's really shooting for the stars. But like why wouldn't he? He's like is he 19, 20 years old. Like why wouldn't he uh, like go for that? And he's doing things that, you know, you've never seen a rookie do. Uh, he's been amazing this year. And like you said, like that confidence is real. Yeah. Like in everything we do, everything. Like mm-hmm. we were filming something the other day where he had to make a jumper and they were like, just don't shoot it right here. Mm-hmm. And he was like, why wouldn't I shoot it? Like shoot it if you think you'll make it. He's like, I'm shooting it. You know yeah, I, mean? like, I think I'll make them all. <laughs> yeah, like that's that's how he is. And yeah. like I love Ben because I love that energy. And like when you have a guy around you like that, it's like how do you not share that? How do you not share that sentiment? Like, this guy's got all that confidence in himself. Like, how do, like, I got to, too. Like, yeah. it's just like the swagger that we play with. And yeah. so um, he's been awesome. Uh, he's a, he's like a quiet guy when you first get to meet him. Mm-hmm. Um, but, he, you know, once he starts to open up, like, man, love having been around. Um, and, you know, he's just a great guy that I can mess around with all the yeah. time. Is confidence a thing that you ever had to work on? For sure. Really? No question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And And I think, like, externally, probably not. Like, uh, like sharing that I have confidence in myself or like looking like I have confidence in myself. I don't think I've ever had to work on that, but inside, like having to think like, yeah, for sure. Like when I first got to college, um, you know, I was like expected, kind of expected to like red shirt and like mentally I was like, I'm not red shirting yeah. no chance. And like I lived that externally. Like I, I worked so hard and uh, I believed in everything I did, but on the inside there was like self doubt for sure. Um, and like, you kind of got to work on that as time goes on. And then, um, uh, you know, I think going back to the trade, right? Like when I got traded, I was like, I'm, I was like, yeah, like externally, I was like, I'm mad, but I'm like, I'm, I know I'm, I know I'm good. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not worried. I'm, I'm gonna have, be great in Indiana. But on the inside, a little bit, I was like, I don't know. Like, I might go there and struggle. Like, I, I, I had to like think about that for a second. And like, you don't want to show that as an athlete, because I, I, sometimes because I feel like if if I were to come out and say that or something like that, like if somebody could. It's like smelling blood in the water sometimes for other athletes, right? Yeah. Like they see that and now mm-hmm. they want to say something, right? Or like get like, you know, uh, attack you more and now you're thinking about it more. Uh, but yeah, I was definitely there at one point. And mm-hmm. there is times like we talked about earlier with my shot or whatever, when you're struggling, you think about it a little bit. Uh, but it's just kind of understanding who you are. And I was talking to Rico Hines the other day out with, with me and Zach and mm-hmm. it's like family to me. And he was like, you worked so hard to to take the last shot to do certain things like like why do you work what's the point of working then like why mm-hmm. why do you work so hard if you're not going to use that to trust your ability and I thought that was really like it was like something small but I really had to think about that like yeah. that's real like I do work really hard and like so I have to trust myself to take shots or uh, like I've earned that right you know yeah. by, by my hard work so um, yeah I think that's a great perspective on it yeah because it it sounds like you're saying confidence is really about like trusting your own ability but like trusting that you can do it yeah yeah and so if you're dealing with that internally what are like the tools that you are like flexing to get better at that internally yeah like how do you do that yeah yeah yeah. I, I think um what you talked about a little earlier about like kind of like goal setting um and like kind of 
the people always say like, <laughs> you hear girls have all the time we're like in like love, right? Like words of affirmation, right? You know what I mean? Is that your love language? No, nah, that's not my oh, that's love, your language. love language. That's not my love language. <laughs> uh, but um, like, I think kind of like internal words of affirmation for myself, right? Yeah. To be like, this is what I want to do. This, these are my goals. This is like how I see myself as a player. And like, I need to truly believe that inside for me to achieve that. And like coming into this year, I was like, I feel like I could be a 20 and 10 guy in the league. And like some people were like, yeah, that's probably realistic. And some people were like, that's going to be tough. And mm -hmm. like on the inside, uh, I was just like, no, like I can do that. And I don't care what people think. Like that's doable for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm right there at that goal as of right now. And like, so like on the inside, like I truly believe that. And so it's easy to like live that out. Like the fact that I truly believe it. No, I love that you're saying on this because I am such a firm believer in the fact that confidence is a tool. Like, you should be as confident as you are kind or as you are a hard worker, like all of the traits that we discuss. Confidence, I think, is kind of the foundation of all of those things because if you don't fully believe in those things about yourself, there's no way you can expect anyone else to fully believe in those things. Yeah, sure. But it is something you also do have to work on. And sometimes working on confidence means really working on that thing that you need to be confident about. So I'm happy that, like, this journey has led you to like more supreme confidence in yourself and that's bled into all of the other things um, that you're doing as well. Yeah. Um, one thing I always ask though, because I know we, we talked about the draft a bit, it's fascinating to me when players are coming into the league and they're like fulfilling this dream and they have all these players they've been watching their whole lives and now they know that they're going to go against them. You're obviously over all of the like fanning that you are now because you've been in the league for some time at this point. But which player took the longest for you to get over the fact that you would be playing against them? <laughs> uh, oh man that's crazy i i don't know I, I think there's a lot of guys like my first preseason game was dame and Melo, and i was like and cj and i was like nah this is crazy right now like yeah. i don't even know what's going on uh i've told a cp story where he thought i said something to him on the bench but i was really just like looking at him like yo it's cp and somebody else said something he thought it was me and he was mad at me um is he over it now he's over it now okay. we're good now <laughs> uh but I think everybody thought it was going to be LeBron for me because I grew up, I had a LeBron fathead on my wall. Like, you know, the big life-size dunk picture. Yeah. Um, and by the time I played him at the end of the year, I was kind of over that, like you said, like the, the fan aspect of things. Mm -hmm. For me, it was probably Kyrie. I'm going to be mm -hmm. real. Because, like, I grew up a big Bron fan. So, like, the 2016 Cavs championship, like, I was fully invested in that whole year and the uh, playoff run, the finals run. And so, like... To me, he's like, Kyrie has no weaknesses as a basketball player. And I believed yeah. that before I was in the NBA. And I, I believe that even more as an NBA player. Really? And Kyrie Love is a that. guy who's like, like, he's my position as well. You know what I mean? So, like, I'm really, he's, like, guarding me. Like, I'll guard him. Like, I'll get switched on to him from time to time. Like, we're the same position. So, it, like, he's in front of me more. And the first time I ever played, or first time I played him, he had 40. Second time I played him, I had a really good game. And he, like, acknowledged me after the game we had a like great conversation after the game and that meant a lot to me because then that was kind of like the like I was like all right Kyrie said what up to me James said what up to me and they both told me like just keep going um and after that one I was kind of like all right I'm, I'm yeah you're like I'm the, cool on all of like, it now I'm over the fan <laughs> things like I'm good to have an NBA player now yeah, yeah. no that's so far because it's like that is such a tangible way that you're like no I, I made it. Yeah. I'm doing the thing that I have worked to do my entire life. And I am amongst the people that I have been watching my entire life. Yeah. And sports is just it's one of the, the few things where like you very visibly see the dream come true. I just think it's, it's really great. Like That's why I love draft night. It's probably my favorite of all of it because that's the beginning of this moment. Yeah, for you sure. Know? For sure. And yeah, Kai, Kai's, probably, Kai's probably the number one. Fred Van Vliet said something to me early in the early in my rookie career too mm -hmm. that like I've never talked about before but that was probably the first like confidence boost or like like yo you're nice from an, another NBA player that like you know like a significant NBA player that I was like oh like maybe I'm okay you know like yeah. Fred we played the Raptors they smacked us they beat us bad we were up like 20 at one point in the game and then I think and then and then they started going crazy they beat us by like 25 and after the game, Fred came up to me. He was like, yo, young fella, like, where you are right now, like, you got to achieve for more. Like, right now you're a role player off the bench. Now you want to get to a six-man. How do you get from a six-man to a starter? How do you get from a starter to a star? How do you get from a star, you know, all-star, superstar? Like, 
and like for Fred to pull me aside and like it was kind of like he I don't know if he like saw that in me necessarily but it was kind of like not nah, like believe in what you you know believe in believe in yourself and like that's his big thing right bet on yeah, yourself yeah bet on yourself and when Fred said that to me it was kind of like that that meant a lot to me to be honest and like I've never talked about that before but uh yeah, Fred saying that to me, it meant a lot to me early in my career. And still, like, every time I play Fred, it's like I always remember, you know, kind of those words you gave me, and that, that means a lot to me. I love that. So what do you think Fred Van Vliet saw in you in that moment? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, have, I probably had a decent game that game, and I don't know. I, I was left in the game at the end of the game. I felt like I was probably still playing hard, and um, I don't know. I think he just saw me as a basketball player and guy who played hard and, uh, just kind of saw, you know, something in me that, you know, maybe I didn't even see it myself, to be honest. Yeah. And so, like, for him to, like, pull me aside to say that, that's just why I'm, like, man, like, as a – when I'm, like, an older NBA guy, like, I hope, I hope like, I can have a moment like Fred had that, like, impacted me. I hope I can have that on somebody else. Yeah, that you've, like, carried with you and remember. Yeah, have you sure. been able to tell Fred what it meant to you? No, nah, we've never talked about it. Now, now when I see him, it's like a pickup run, uh, <laughs> and it's, like, kind of just play it. I've never, I've never talked to him about it before. But you would want him to know that yeah. this is, you hold that moment for sure, for close. Sure. Yeah. No, I love that. I'll make sure. I'll send this to Fred. All make right. sure that he knows. Um, okay, one more question for you. If you weren't an NBA player, what would you be doing? Wow. it's a heck of a question. I went to school for business management my freshman year. My sophomore year, I went to school for basketball. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it would be anything necessarily in the business world, but... Uh, I don't know. That's a great question. Probably something in the fashion world, to be honest. Ooh. Yeah, yeah probably something there. Uh, I saw you being in the fits off in the tunnel been, this I've year. I've been trying to get some fits off. Yeah. Uh, my, we got like a little shorts line we're doing here soon when it gets warmer. Uh, like, <laughs> little, uh, that, that stuff's just interesting to me. And I've always wanted, I've always enjoyed like putting my name on things like as a kid, like shoes or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Like I was that kid who went on Nike ID all day just to put, you know, his name on the shoes or whatever. <laughs> Never bought him, though. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, probably something in the fashion world. Don't know exactly what, uh, but I would love to do, you know, T-shirts or shorts or whatever. Like, that, that stuff interests me. I thought you'd say WWE. Oh. I, I have a low pain tolerance. Okay, so yeah, you can't do I it. I couldn't do it. I could, I could be a talker on there. And, like, <laughs> they told me, they came to Indy, and we're in season, so, like, they were a little like, they were like, yo, we didn't know you were going to come, so we didn't like plan for you to do anything. Uh, so hopefully one day we can. But I'm oh, not yeah. going to ask for permission. I'm probably going to ask for ask forgiveness. forgiveness. Yeah, yeah. They will not let me do that. <laughs> yeah. Every patient person here, close your ears. Yeah. Close <laughs> no, what would your WWE persona be? Like, what, what is the Tyrese? I like I don't know identity in, w- in WWE the arrogant guy like the bad guys are more I'm more of a fan of them. But you are like so not bad guy. I know, but it's a persona. It's like you know what I mean. Yeah. It's, it's I mean not I mean they're not real monsters. They're, yeah, it'll you know be I mean? your alter ego. You yeah. would step into that and be able to be like. Yeah, you know, I, I talk a lot, so I could you know. Yeah. Hopefully, I have like a big dude next to me who does all the. Fighting, and I'm just kind of the talker. You know, like, that <laughs> yeah. would be, that'd probably be me. And then you just stick him on everybody. Yeah, where yeah. get a nice fit off yeah. every every week. <laughs> yeah, that'd be me, for sure. I love that. Well, you truly, you know that I mean this. You're one of my absolutely favorite people in the league. Thank you so much for doing this, giving us your time. And I love watching you with the Pacers, and I hope that it continues to just be up from here. Yeah, thank yeah. you. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks, Tyrese. 